When I was a small boy and lived in the tropics, at that time my parents were great lovers of the theatre. And I was taken very frequently indeed to see good plays. One of the most memorable experiences was to go and see Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night's Dream, which was done in the open air. All the actors were one side of the river, and then there was a very quiet and still river, except for a few tropical type bullfrogs, and we sat the other side of the river. And it was a quiet, quiet night, except for these creatures. Every word could be heard, and as a small boy I remember being entirely captured by this play. And when I was wondering just what would happen and where it would go next, they suddenly proclaimed an interval. And everything in my boyish heart sank with disappointment. And I sat back in my chair and thought, well, what is the purpose of an interval? Then my mother leaned over and began to explain some of the things which had happened in the play which I had missed. And then she explained some of the things which were yet to happen for fear that I wouldn't understand them. And as I look back, I'm very grateful for the interval. Without the interval, I would have missed a great deal of what was happening and my understanding would have been very limited indeed. So there's great value in an, in in an interval or an interlude. And tonight we come to an interlude in the Gospel according to John. We've seen a great deal of action. Now there's an interval where certain things are explained to us before the action continues. And rather than having any sense of disappointment at this interlude, we can learn things in it which are extremely valuable to us. We can learn about some of the things which have already happened. They will come into clearer focus. And if we listen to what's explained during the interlude, the interval, some things in the future studies in John's Gospel will also become clear to us. Now this interlude is in chapter 3 and verse 22. We've studied the second sign of Jesus, how he, dis he turned people out of the temple, that great display of authority. And we've listened to his teaching of Nicodemus, and inside us, everything is saying, well, what will the third sign be? What will Jesus do next? And what will the next piece of teaching be? But instead we have this interval. Now, in this interval, we have a question, an answer, and an explanation. So let's first of all go to the question and look at verses 22 to 26. Now if you look at verse 22 you'll see that Jesus and his disciples have now left the city of Jerusalem where the temple had been cleansed and where Nicodemus had been spoken to. And yet they remain in the countryside of Judea which is nearby. And there our Lord remains with his disciples and he baptizes and maybe he was there for a considerable time. In verse 23, John, the writer, is very careful to point out that while Jesus was doing that, John the Baptist was doing the same thing in another locality not very far away and makes it plain from verse 24 that he continued to do that until he was cast into prison. We know, don't we, from Matthew's Gospel and from Mark's Gospel that our Lord's ministry didn't really become public in the proper sense of that word until after John was cast into prison. So we have this situation. Jesus in the desert, teaching, baptising. John in the desert, teaching and baptising. And both of them not very far from each other. Both of them in out-of-the-way places, both at the same time, and at least outwardly, both of them doing exactly the same thing. Now John had been saying, and we've been studying this, that he was a voice crying in the wilderness. He had pointed 
to Christ and said, follow Christ, he's the Messiah. We've seen in fact how two of John's disciples had left John and gone to follow Christ. They had left John for Jesus. And you would think, wouldn't you, that having pointed to Christ, John's ministry would be finished. After all, he'd been telling us that he had come to prepare the way for Christ. But now Christ has come. So you would think it would be time for him to stand down there and then. But instead, we have these two ministries going on at the same time. And to all outward appearances, they look exactly as if they're doing the same thing. Now I hope that you can see that this would create problems in people's minds particularly in the minds of the disciples of John the Baptist. John had been asked, are you the Messiah? No. Christ is. Jesus is. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the great prophet who has been promised? No. Who are you then? A voice crying in the wilderness. That one, he is the promised Christ, he is the promised Messiah, he is the one you are expecting, He's the Lamb of God. He's the, sin of God, the Son of God. And yet, John hadn't stood down. He was still preaching like he'd always preached. He was still baptizing like he'd always baptized. And people were still coming to him as they'd always come. And things appeared to be going on as usual. We read therefore in verse 25 these words. Then there arose a question. And we can, in fact, correctly translate it. There arose a question, therefore. Because these two ministries were going on at the same time, this raised questions in people's minds. And this is the question to which we're coming. At that time, as verse 25 tells us, some of John's disciples got into an argument with a Jew. They got into an argument about purifying. John wasn't preaching politics. Preachers of the gospel shouldn't be preaching politics. And Jesus wasn't preaching politics. John wasn't preaching economics. And Jesus wasn't preaching economics. They were both preaching cleansing. It was the whole point of the fact that they were both baptizing. The great subject of both ministries was the question of cleansing. How can you be clean from your sin? How can you have a heart washed? How can you be right in the sight of God? How is the pollution of the human heart dealt with? These were the questions which both John in his ministry and Jesus in his ministry were answering. And so the question was a question about purifying. Now we have no clue in verse 25 as to how the argument between John's disciples and the Jews went. But what we do know that at the end of the argument they went back to John the Baptist in verse 26. And we have what they said there. Look at verse 26. Rabbi... They said to John the Baptist, He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So the subject has arisen as a result of comparing these two ministries, and whatever way the course of the argument went, John the Baptist's disciples now had a note of resentment in their minds. Do you remember that Jesus who you said was the Christ? You pointed to him when you were on the other side of the Jordan. Well, everybody's going to him. And you can detect a little note of jealousy and a note of resentment there. They were tired of hearing that this new teacher was more successful than their teacher. That was the situation and now you can see really, although it's not put as a question, what the question was in people's minds. The question in people's minds was this. Here are two parallel ministries. 
Two people who, to all intents and appearances, appear at least to be doing the same thing. What is the relationship between the two? Between John and Jesus, between Jesus and John? Are they the same? And if, if, if so, uh, why, why do both of them need to minister? Are they different? In which case, in what way are they different? Is Jesus really a greater success than John? If so, what does John think of him? Does he think of him as a rival or an enemy or a colleague and a friend? What really is the relationship between John the Baptist, who's had all the attention until now, and Jesus, who is fast catching all the attention? That was the question in their minds. Well, from that question, we go to the answer. Look now at verse 27, right through to the end of verse 30. Because in this interlude, we have a question, an answer, and an explanation. Look at verse 27, where John begins his answer, John the Baptist. What John the Baptist did, and the more I read of him, the more I admire him, was that he underlined a great principle. Here were his disciples who were beginning to burn with jealousy because Jesus appeared to be doing the same thing as their master but having more success. John the Baptist must kill the idea that there is any rivalry between him and Jesus. And so he underlines a great principle it's a principle to, remember, to be remembered then and it's a principle to be remembered now. It's there in verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Now what John is saying there is perfectly clear. No man can exercise a ministry with spiritual effects without the authority of heaven. Can't be done. Both he and Jesus were undoubtedly authorised to their tasks. Their tasks were different, but they were both authorised from the same place. And therefore there is no possibility of John and Jesus being considered to be rivals. In verse 28, John the Baptist defines what his own ministry was. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. I've received a ministry from heaven, says John the Baptist. The ministry I've received is that I've been sent not to be the Christ, but to prepare the way for Christ. I am not the Christ, I've been sent to do that. I've not been sent as the Christ, but I have been sent nonetheless. So John the Baptist isn't pouring scorn on his own ministry. He's showing that he has heaven sent authority for his ministry. Jesus has heaven sent authority for his. Their ministries are different, but they have the same authority. They, they're authorised at least from the same place. Therefore they can't be thought of as rivals. Then he uses a vivid picture in verse 29. In fact, John, whenever he spoke of Christ, used vivid pictures. You remember already in his preaching, he's spoken of Christ as a man coming with a fan in his hand, or as one coming with fire, or as one coming with an axe, or he's described him as the one who is the Lamb of God. But this time he uses a completely different picture to describe the relationship between himself and Christ. He speaks of Jesus in verse 29 as the bridegroom. It wasn't a new picture. Hosea had already used that in the Old Testament and so had Ezekiel and so had Malachi and so had Solomon in the Song of Songs. 
But he speaks of Jesus as the bridegroom and he speaks of himself as the friend of the bridegroom or as we would say in modern English, the best man. Now, is there any competition in the strictest sense of the word between the bridegroom and the best man? They're not rivals. They're the best of friends. They're complementary to each other. They have different roles but and they have differences in function and in importance but you don't uh, regard a best man and a bridegroom as rivals. Nonetheless, remember this that when John said this, verse 29 people wouldn't think of our type weddings they would think of eastern weddings and eastern weddings were a bit different from ours for a lot of reasons. Uh, the wedding reception, for instance, was a, a little bit uh, a longer affair than ours and you had to have usually about 10 or 12 bridesmaids and so on. But that's not the point here. In an Eastern wedding reception, in an Eastern wedding, should I say, the groom said nothing until a certain point was reached in the service. In would come the bride and she would be escorted to her husband-to-be not by her father but by the best man. The best man would introduce the bride to the bridegroom and as a sign that he accepted the bride for the first time in the service the bridegroom would speak and he didn't speak until the formal moment when he accepted the bride. And at that stage the best man handed over the bride and that's what John is talking about here. Look at verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. That's my role, says John. I'm the best man and I'm filled with joy because the bridegroom has spoken and accepted his bride. I must decrease. He must increase. That's the great classic verse. Of course, I've put it round the other way, but I'll put it right in a minute. Now, because you imagine the wedding. In comes the bride, escorted by the best man. All eyes are upon the bride. They're always on the bride. Now, if you don't believe that, come to the next wedding. Everybody looks at the bride. But when they're looking at the bride, they're looking at the best man as well in this particular wedding. Now they're watching as the best man hands over the bride to the bridegroom. Now all eyes are on the bride and the best man and the bridegroom. So all eyes, for a few minutes at least, have both the best man and the bridegroom in their vision at the same time. But of course, when the ceremony is over, it's not the best man who goes away with the bride. It's the bridegroom. And so all eyes eventually are on the bridegroom and the best man fades out of the picture discreetly. Can you see what John is saying? All eyes have been on him because he's been the one who's escorting the bride. For a little while all eyes will be on him and the bridegroom together. But as he hides hands over the bride, it won't be long before all eyes are on the bridegroom and he will fade out of the picture. That's precisely what he means when he says in verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. Because you'll remember that John the Baptist had been preaching that Christ is the Messiah. He'd already encouraged, as we've seen, two of his disciples to go after Christ. Christ had accepted them and they'd become Christian believers, as had a few others. For a while, these two men had their ministries side by side. But the future was to be a stepping down of John and our Lord Jesus Christ having more and more attention he had led the bride to Christ. Christ had spoken and accepted the bride, the bride being his, those who believe in him. And before long, all eyes would be on Christ alone, 
and there would be no eyes left on John the Baptist. As I said to you just now, I admire John the Baptist. John the Baptist was content to be nothing. He was content to be unnoticed, provided his Saviour received the attention. Are you? John the Baptist was content to point to the Saviour and to be forgotten himself. Are you? Jesus called that attitude spiritual greatness when he spoke later of the qualities of the life of John the Baptist. Spiritual greatness is the contentment to be unnoticed as long as Christ is noticed. So we've had a question an answer and we conclude by looking at verses 31 to the end of the chapter by having an explanation. We've seen the question what is the relationship between these two ministries? We've seen the answer the relationship between them is the relationship of a best man to a bridegroom. But now John the writer adds his own personal comments from verse 31 onwards. Here is the Apostle John, never confuse him with John the Baptist, here is the Apostle John adding his comments on the things which he's just recorded. You see, John the Baptist has been showing the difference between himself and Christ. And now John the Apostle, who's writing the Gospel, is going to stress the infinite distance that there is between the best man and the bridegroom. The great difference there is between John the Baptist and the Son of God. Look at verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. That's Christ. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. That's John the Baptist. He that cometh from heaven is above all. That's Christ. Now if we can have an interlude within this interlude, if you see what I mean, notice that verse 31 does not say he that came from above is above all. It says he that cometh. In other words, he who, com he who comes and is still coming. It does not say, he that came from heaven is above all. It says, he that comes from heaven is above all. We have there just a hint into the great truth of the eternal generation of the Son. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He is God in the same sense as the Father is, and he is God in the same sense as is the Holy Ghost. And yet everything, and this is the mystery of it, everything that Jesus Christ is, he owes to the Father. That is the mystery of the eternal generation of the Son. He was never born, and yet his life flows from the Father. That's one... And John the Baptist, says John, is of the earth, earthly, and speaketh of the earth. There's no disrespect there for John the Baptist, it's just the limitations of his ministry are being recognised. But here now you can see the great difference. Two men in the wilderness, baptising, people coming to them, alright, one a bridegroom and one a best man. But the difference is greater than that. John the Baptist, born of the earth speaking of the earth in other words a mere man Jesus begotten as far as his human nature is concerned he was born but as far as his actual person is concerned begotten never had a beginning although his life always proceeds from the father not from the earth from heaven and able to speak of heaven and says John twice in verse 31 
above all. He's the God man. And that was the difference between the two ministries in the desert. One was a man speaking the words that God gave to him. One was God speaking the things which he had seen in eternity and heard from the Father himself who was God amongst us as a man. That's the difference. So much for the difference between them as persons. Look at verse 32. Let's see the difference between them in ministry. Look at verse 32. What he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. The great facts of eternity, Jesus saw. All right, you've heard of the archangel, Jesus saw him. You've heard of the Father, Jesus saw him. You've heard of the Holy Spirit, Jesus saw him. You've heard of the great facts of, God, of the Godhead and of the heavenly world. Jesus saw it all. He can speak uniquely about it as we saw in chapter 3 and verse 13. And the things that he's heard, he can speak. You've read in the Old Testament that God the Father commissioned God the Son to come into the world. You've read it. But Jesus heard it. He heard from God the Father the commission to come into the world to save his church. He saw it and he heard it and it's those things that he speaks. That's the great difference in the ministry between John the Baptist and Jesus. <coughs> Nobody else but Jesus, the Son of God, could do that. And yet, look at the surprising thing which is said at the end of verse 32. And no man receiveth his testimony. When Jesus speaks of heaven, he speaks with authority, with personal knowledge, uniquely. And yet by and large, and that's true today also, men and women just do not heed what the Son of God says. But thank God some of them do. Look at verse 33. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. In other words, when people hear the teaching of Christ, the majority of them treat it as if someone's trying to pull the wool over their eyes. They don't accept it as the truth of God. But there are those who, when they hear the teaching of Christ, accept it as the truth of God. They set their seal to this fact that God in Christ is telling them the truth. Because, verse 34, it was God who sent Christ. And therefore the words which Christ speaks are God's words. And that is true because of verse 34. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Well, says somebody, Pastor, it's it's getting on a bit and it's getting a bit difficult. Well, think of it like this. Imagine the most godly person that you've ever met. You found out, didn't you, after you knew them a few weeks or months, that they had a few blind spots and a few warts and, and they weren't quite as godly as you thought. Didn't you? You've met people who you thought were absolutely perfect so some people who made such an impression on you that when they walk down the aisle of the church all the hairs on your backbone stand up. Perhaps there isn't anybody like that here but I, I knew a few like that years ago and uh, I know a few like that today. And you feel, oh, to be as godly as that. And yet when you get to know them a little you find that they're men after all, they're women after all. They've, they're filled with the Spirit. It's the only word you could use. Their personality is dominated by the Holy Spirit and yet not completely dominated. There's still faults and things in them which you can, even you can see as faults. So they're filled with the Spirit but not completely dominated by the Spirit. 
and therefore although 90% of the time when they speak they may speak things which are true and righteous there are those occasions where what they say isn't exact or slightly off beam and sometimes actually wrong now it was never like that with Christ never God doesn't give the spirit by measure unto him because in Christ the whole fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily the whole of the Holy Ghost dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ because he enjoys that intimate union with him as members together of the glorious Trinity there is no limit to his spirituality and there is no part of Christ which is tainted or touched with sin or imperfection or falling short and therefore you can be certain that everything which Jesus says is absolutely so because God gives not the spirit by measure unto him that's the great difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist he was sent by God he was God he was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb but in him the whole fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily so we read in verse 35 that Christ's relationship to God is unique the Father loveth the Son the relationship which these glorious persons have to each other can be described in such homely language as Father and Son and they are bound together as members of the Godhead by a bond of love the Trinity is a, is a personality of love and have given all things into his hand which means that everything that God does he does through Christ everything how did God make the world? through Christ how does God uphold the world? through Christ how does God save sinners? through Christ how does God judge the world? all men, women and angels through Christ how does God end the world? through Christ how does God create his heaven for his people? through Christ everything which God ever did and does he has done and does do through Christ and that's why the chapter concludes as it does there is no hope of anybody having the life of God in their soul that's eternal life who therefore does not come to Christ because everything that God does even the giving of eternal life which is the placing of his own life in the human soul he does that through Christ he doesn't do it through Christianity he doesn't do it through church he doesn't do it through Bible reading although these things are vitally important he does it through Christ he doesn't do it through your good thoughts or your good works or your good intentions or your hopes or your desires or your tears or your heartbreaks he gives eternal life only through Christ and therefore there is no hope of anybody ever having eternal life who is cut off from Christ which is why the chapter finishes he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him there is no greater sin than neglect of Christ God loves his Son if you don't love him then God's anger abides on you God does everything through his Son and therefore if you don't come to his Son you cut yourself off from the only fount of life and you spit upon the one whom God puts all his favour upon and God's wrath therefore abides upon you so tonight there are several things after this interval which we should understand do you now understand that however great a man is like John the Baptist he can never be as great as Christ because every man comes from the earth but he comes from heaven therefore there should be no one greater in your estimation than Christ do you understand that even the greatest servant of God is only a pointer to Christ 
and he himself has no actual power to help you or to save you. Do you now understand that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who has perfectly revealed God and is invested with all God's power and if you are to be saved from God's wrath it must be by God's Son. Do you now, un now understand that the only alternatives in the world are faith in Christ or eternal damnation? And do you now understand that because tonight you have had Christ's unique place explained to you, you are totally inexcusable if you go to anybody else for your eternal salvation? The only hope for you lies to fall at his feet, not at any preacher's, and to say to him personally, God, for that's who he is, be merciful to me, a sinner.